everyone this is going to be the third part of the uh, lecture introduction to the divergence in Stokes theorem so here I tried rather than just continuing it, I try to put all these important theorems in this um, different types of integral all together kind of try to summarize and kind of try to different um, introduce a different view of this phenomenon so um, I called it everything the fundamental theorem for vector field so everything we are doing is a pretty much vector field so I wrote it as a fundamental theorem for vector fields this includes line integral and Stokes theorem and divergence theorem all together but the way I presented um, throughout the lecture in class or here in the video is using this differential form which is nicely summarized in a computational level what is happening it summarized very nicely so let me present it this way First, let's take a look at the line integral. This is vector line integral of the vector field. This is a notation. This indicates that what we're really doing is a vector dotted with the velocity vector, and that's uh, what we're calculating. But if you look at the bits and pieces and the component wise, what's really happening is this form: x component of the um, vector field multiplied by dx dt. This is the parameter-free notation. So this whole symbol here is called differential form. Whenever you parameterize this c, this dx turns to dx dt, dy dt, and dz dt. So this is a ready-to-use form. So this is not a proper uh, way of defining differential form, but it's, it's good enough to, um, to use it here. Just um, take that as a formal symbol, and it's ready to be used in this way. So this is called differential form in two different notations. Here's a differential two form. This is a surface integral of a vector field with everything here C and S are both oriented. This has orientation, and the surface has orientation. Then um, what we really mean it, um, by this integral is actually we're doing the double integral, which is a flat integral. This R is piece from the flat space, xy plane or uv plane. But what we really do is that we're dotting this vector field with this one of the normal vector which is coming from the parameterization so it's a parameterization sensitive notation is parameterization free notation so if you really break this up you've probably um, seen that I've shown this in the earlier video that this one breaks in, into the following part P is X component of the vector field F and this dy dz is a determinant of two by two matrix that arises when you calculate the cross product of this thing and this is a shorthand notation first column is a prime um, partial derivative with respect to a partial derivative of y and with respect to two variables the surfaces and z fills up the second column of this two by two matrix determinant so this is a shorthand notation for determinant of two by two without absolute value so if you look at the second column it picks up the de um, determinant of these z and x in there and so on so if you expand this one and it looks exactly like that and these wedge product represent the determinant of two by two matrix in this situation so this is again showed exactly what's happening in the computational level and without the parameter attached to it so this is called the differential two forms and we're integrating in differential three form we ran out of space so there's not much to it as this differential three form the only differential three form is this determinant of three by three matrix and then three variable is the maximum you can get so these two things are with a correct orientation of the solid e these two things are equal and p here is not a vector field but just a scalar field but if you happen to be in a higher dimensional space in this differential form and a vector field uh, gets more things to it and you can push to then a higher and higher form but in three-dimensional space this is uh, pretty much it so this is the same thing in differential form notation versus vector field notation now let's take a look at the actual integrals and then how they're related to each other through these fundamental theorems well here's the first full um, first level I call the zero form there's no integral and there's no dx attached to it so it's a formal name to that it's a zero form for the scalar function so integral of a zero form it's um, just defined like this fb minus fa and you know this is uh, by fundamental theorem line integral is equal to this line integral where df is the gradient so let me write that in 
So in vector field notation, this is the same as a gradient multiply the velocity vector. So that's called a integral, a fundamental theorem of line integral. So let's get the next one. This is the um, line integral of general vector field. F is not necessarily a gradient vector or anything, an arbitrary vector field with the PQR components. And then it's a Stokes theorem. If C is the boundary of a surface and the keeping that orientation, that we can write as a double integral, then this double integral of a vector field, that vector field that correspond to this one is called curl. It's not the same as PQR, but it's some, some sort of differential operator on curl um, on the vector field F. So that's a Stokes theorem. Finally, down here, it's a divergence theorem. If you have a general um, line in uh, the surface integral of a vector field F, so I copied it down here so it looks like this general, the line integral of a vector field in differential form looks like this, and the simple calculation of the determinant algebra leads you, you can write it as actually the triple integral of a scalar function, and this is called the divergent F. Okay, so that's the summary of this fundamental theorem uh, for of, of integrals of a vector field. So next thing I want to... Um, introduced here is the idea of starting from the zero form and then arrive here special vector field which is a gradient vector field and you started with a just arbitrary vector field involved in this one form integral calculation and then created this very special vector field called curl f and here again in two forms start with an arbitrary vector field involved in the integral of a two form and then introduce this uh, scalar function a divergent f which is kind of going back to that so this, I'm going to summarize it, these operations. All right, here it is. It summarizes it here. The zero form, we start with a scalar function, and then there is this operator called the gradient. So we created this vector field, right? This gradient F is a vector field. If we happen to have an arbitrary vector field F, and this Stokes theorem introduced um, this a different differential operator, and then we created another vector field, and if you happen to have another vector field in this two-form level, then we can create another differential operator and create a scalar function, right? These are the operators, and then you might have uh, seen that earlier in the section that if you start from the scalar, create the gradient vector, and if you do the curl operator to the gradient vector, and it turns out it's a zero, which is a straightforward calculation. And basically what goes in so the proof is using the Clairaut's theorem. So I stated here what I just said, and then if you start to go here and do the one operation and another operation, it dies. How about in here? If you start with a curl, if you start with a vector field in one form level, if you do the one operation, that's going to give you the curl and put it into a two form integral. And if you do one more operation, and this can arrive it here in the divergent, and then if you actually do the straightforward calculation again, it arrived at a zero. So it's stated here. This is straightforward calculation, but uh, this raises an interesting question, and this is um, what this um, part is about. Let me let me show you this much first. Um, we're looking at this phenomenon here, and let's look at the curl um, being an F. We looked at this question in two-dimensional version, which is we use the Green's theorem, but this is three-dimensional version. So I want you to give a fresh thought to this one. So, so I think about what we just stated here. If we have a gradient vector field, its curl is exactly zero. So if you happen to have a gradient vector field, its curl is zero. So we are in this pool. If you grab an arbitrary vector field, you don't expect this curl of that vector field is zero. But this is a collection of such vector field F, such that the curl of that vector field is zero. In it, there is this gradient vector field. Well, that doesn't mean that everything else that has a curl zero means it's a gradient vector field. Only the gradient vector field has this curl property zero. So whether these two things are equal to or not is an interesting question. In this case, the, the vector field with that, that, with that property that is exactly the gradient of something is called conservative. We have the terminology. And you probably remember that notion is a relative notion to the domain in D. What that means, if you have curl F zero, Locally, if you're looking at just one point around it, a very small region, 
curl F0 means is a gradient vector field. But if you increase your area to the larger area, it turns out these two things are not always the same. That means you can find the um, potential function f such that it can realize a small region, but when you try to extend that potential function, bigger and bigger region, and then it turns out it's some, there is some sort of problem sometimes. So it's a relative notion. So in this, this discrepancies in here, it kind of describes something about the D, and this became an important theme in the geometry and in pure mathematics, and it has application to uh, physics and other areas too. So let's look at the next level. For example, as a curl, this statement says that if you look at the vector field, an arbitrary vector field, and apply the divergence operator, and it became zero. Let's collect all those vector fields with that property. The curl f is one of the things because we, you know, we've checked it before, and the divergence of the curl is going to be always a zero. So the curl is definitely inside this bag. But these two things is not necessarily equal to each other. Again, it's locally, if I have one point around that, the divergence is always zero, then small region around it, it means it's it is actually curl of something. That part's true, but when you're whenever you try to extend that um, little domain to the larger domain of this vector field F we're looking for, sometimes you run into a problem. They're all it's about um, what kind of region you're looking at, how what is your region D you're trying to reach out, and then we encounter sometimes a problem. So let me introduce an example. We can't go through the proof, but we can just state the, some of the facts. For example, we go back to R2. So we only have um, the two components. Let's say our domain is D here. It happened to be this donut shape, and in between the two circles, so that's the shape. So we want to um, define a vector field such that it's defined, of course, as f is defined entire R2, then it's going to be, of course, is have no problem. But suppose this formula is given in this shape, for example, p1 and p2 and q1 and q2, they're all two variable polynomials. But this p2 and q2 have a problem down here or out there such that it cannot be extended to the entire region R2, but it's okay in here. So we have nice, well-defined vector field on this region D, such that if you do the curl operation on this one, which is this one derivative x, this one derivative x, excuse me, minus this one derivative y, you subtract those become zero. Okay, that's the curl for the two variable version. Then, if that's the case, and if you write it, so completely something is not necessarily related. If we have a vector scalar function, which is nicely defined. Again, g is, let's say, is a two-variable polynomial. h is, again, two-variable polynomial. And this h have a problem and becomes a zero, for example, in here, and then it's going to be undefined. But since we're out here, it's OK. So this quotient form of a two so-called rational functions of a two-variable is well-defined on this, on this d. Suppose we're looking at this two type of a thing where it try to make a connection between these two objects, all the vector field with the curl zero, and the gradient vector field that is coming from this shape. And it turns out in this case that all the vector field that we can find it here in this form with a curl equal zero is not necessarily equal to uh, the gradient vector field. That means some of the vector fields here we can define it here cannot be realized as a gradient vector field. So these two things are not the same in this case. So again, like I said before, these two objects in two different notions and its discrepancies, uh, it's not exactly equal to the same, equal to each other, tells you about the, some sort of shape about this domain D. This is in another example, but it's happening in R3. Let's say we have a surface D, which is the surface of this torus, donut shape, only the surface part. And suppose we have happen to have this vector field of this type of shape, and, and these p, q, and r are all well defined in the entire R3, but some of them happen to be in the denominator, so that um, sometimes it's not defined, but such that suppose that um, these p, q, p2, q2, r2 are all outside of d or inside of here, so just on that surface d, this f is well defined. In other words, on that point, on that D, 
this denominator is never zero. So we have a nicely defined vector field on that. And the same if we have a scalar function is given in this form and such that this h is only at zero and outside this d that includes this middle region down there. So if you look at all the collection of d, I forgot to put this a curl uh, f equals zero. We're looking at this type of vector field with curl f equals zero. So add it in there and this gradient vector field. And how is this different? And it turns out, and because of this shape, again it happens that the curl, and there are more vector fields than just a gradient vector field whose curl equals zero. So whenever we are doing some sort of calculation in higher dimensional space, because you have lots of parameters, but you kind of parameterize inside with the two variables, and then you happen to be doing this calculation of integral to calculate the flux, and you can't just simply assume, okay, that the curl of f um, doesn't mean that it's a gradient of something. Maybe the shape you're dealing with inside that high dimensional space you cannot see, maybe it's in that shape. In that case, the conclusion we have to make here has to be more careful. Here's the last example. What about that same old sphere D? So if you look at the sphere D here, and suppose that all the same situation we have this vector field given in that form so it's only okay on that d but you might have some denominator zero outside this d zero so we have well-defined um, vector field like that and this time it turns out curl of that thing here is a zero is exactly equal to the gradient vector field equal to zero so what's going on here is about distinguishing the shape of this object here and using this calculation how different is it if it is a different as a vector space is they calculated the dimension the difference of the dimension between these two things and they realize it if the dimension is high and some sort of uh, this type of thing is going on a lot so those areas called the differential topology and then in, when you calculate something and knowing this situation is very very important as you can see if you want to understand what's happening to the flows of the things and if you want to understand what's happening and you need to understand what's going on with the curl and divergence and it is depending on your abstract the shape of your abstract space okay let's come back to calculus 3 and let's think about these uh, the cool applications of these observations First one, it's going to be a merely review, but it's put into a slightly different way of expressing it. So let's say we're in a safe zone. There's no point where this vector field we're looking at, PQR, is not defined. So in R3, everything is well defined. PQR is perfectly fine. And we're looking at this two different line integral of a vector field, of the same vector field, but over two different paths. But let's say the C1 is going through a different path but it starts and arrives in the same uh, places and C2 go through a slightly different path and so on. These two line integrals of course is not necessarily the same but if you have the property that curl f equals zero then these two thing will be exactly the same. So in earlier if if you're in this type of region everything is well defined in R3 curl f equals zero does imply path independence right? So that's uh, that's what we um, wanted to use here, not necessarily concluding that curl f equals zero in this um, full region, then this um, vector field f is going to be the gradient vector field. That's a stronger result, but just to conclude this part, all we need is just curl f zero, and that uses Stokes' theorem. So you start from here, and then if you calculate these um, Okay, that, I don't want to go over the proof, I just want to mention that it's the relevant theorem. But let's look at the similar thing down here in, in using this divergence theorem. So let's look at this situation. We are looking at the surface integral of the same vector field, such that we have one surface S1 and one surface S2, and its boundary, this notation of the boundary, is ex exactly the same. That means including the orientation is exactly the same. But with this no condition on f, we don't expect these two surface integral being the same. But with the, this condition, namely called divergence zero, with this divergence um, f equals zero, with that condition, turns out these two integrals, 
a surface integral exactly the same as long as they have the same boundary so it's like this one c1 and c2 had the same boundary starts and end those are the boundary of these two curves then these line integrals are the same if you have a two different surface of the same boundary if the divergence is zero then it turns out these two integrals are exactly the same all uses this condition r3 in there this is a very powerful application that it, um, it creates. At the same time, it's, it's very difficult to understand and what's, what's happening here, to visualize what kind of vector field it, it, this one is. I think we tried an earlier to understand why this isn't true for this line integral. If you look at the vector field sketched in here and even in two dimensional spaces, we can roughly argue that, okay, going around in a kind of cancellation, so it's roughly the same, but it's still a very intriguing property to understand by looking at the um, sketch of a vector field that exactly these two things are exactly the equal. That's quite interesting. And even the surface integral is even more difficult. I'm going to show you some of the animation, but let me first uh, mention this power powerful application first. Sorry, it goes like this. Let's look at the C is the curve that is sharing the same boundary. S1 is a slightly smaller surface area region. S2 is kind of bubbled up, but it's kind of pointing upward relative to this curve of a C. So this is exactly the S1 and S2 whose boundary is exactly the same as the C. So we're looking at these two, the two different surfaces, and this one is asserting if we happen to have a vector field whose divergence is zero, then the surface integral, which measures the flux, right? So let me write this one down. So let me remind you what this really measures here is the number of molecules is going across this S1 of following this vector field. And that's what this one really measures. So what this one says is that, okay, if I put S1 here, even this flat, think about this minimal surfaces, surfaces that has a boundary in C, the number of particles, there is uh, molecules, I was interested in back, and then again, it's, it's amazing the number of molecules is going through per second in here is exactly the same as number of molecules go, going through that um, that area. Then, if you think about it, if it's really the flow, and maybe it, it, that makes sense, whatever that goes inside in here and have to come outside exactly the same rate. With that physical interpretation, it's kind of makes sense, but it's not, still, I've, I've I find it is difficult to visualize. So let's see why this one is even true with the divergence f equals zero. So don't feel that physical explanation really proves this this part of the completely different description. So if you're looking at that kind of vector field in that arises in, uh, in the actual nature, um, the word flow of water and not losing or pouring in anything, so kind of number of mo molecules is exactly the same all the time then how do we describe that kind of vector field? And this one is pretty much saying, um, using this R3 condition everywhere is defined, that kind of vector field must have this characteristic, the divergent f equals zero. So it's a mathematical description of the vector field we observe in the nature. So let's see why this is so. Is the, um, at least just explain this one. It's not proof. It's a very simple picture, but let's uh, make sense out of it. First of all, and this one is S1 oriented upward. We're keeping, I'm going to flip this uh, sign of um, orientation of C, so I'm going to call it negative C, and then flip the orientation downward, this N, so this whole thing is going to call the negative S1. So this um, surface is now has negative S1 notation, and because of the boundary, it must have this negative C. Right, here's a very difficult to see, but uh, S1 that we just constructed is called negative S1, fits right underneath this part, which is this C here. So that whole thing is S1. S2 is the same as S2. Now, if you look at this S1 joined with the negative S1, this kind of creates a nice solid region. So in between S1 and negative S, S, negative S1, there is a solid region. That I'm going to call on solid E. Then this S2 and negative S1 together forms a kind of boundary surface of this solid E. So that's the situation. So now here's cool things happening now. This S tilde is the boundary, the closed surface. With this, you know, if you can see here, that part is actually outward. 
for the solid E. So if you do this, closed surface of, um, of a solid E, then we can do the divergence theorem, you go in there. But we have a property that the divergence is a zero, assumed to be zero, so that picks up the zero integral value. Okay, so here's the final bit. This whole surface integral is a zero. Now you can break this up into S2 part and negative S1 part. And then if you move it around, of course, a negative orientation to simply change the sign of the integral. So we end up at, okay, S1 and S2 is the same. All right, here is an example. We're looking at a surface integral over S of this vector field. It's given here, and S is this region. And the parts of this size of the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 1, and top part is given by this plane y plus z equals 2, and then bottom part's open. So we recognize this as a circular boundary there, as a boundary of the surface S. And we're asked to calculate the surface integral of this vector field. So here I'm showing the theorem again. If you're looking at the surface integral, such that its divergence is exactly zero, then you can replace that surface integral with a different surface whose boundary is the same. So again, if it is all happening, it's kind of this one takes care of we're actually looking at the curl of something if it is all defined um, around that region. So that's the key. So we're back here. So if the divergence of this one is zero, that's a good sign it's going to be the same um, so I'm already showing it here, so let me just explain. So uh, we're going to first calculate the divergence. Did I calculate divergence? Right, um, I did it kind of backwards, so let me do this one first. Let's check the divergence. X component differentiated with respect to X here, so this negative Y. There's no Y component here, it's 0 and Z, that gives you Y. Therefore this thing is going to be 0. So the divergence is 0. Because this vector field is defined everywhere, that what this really means, again, um, there's no denominator zero case here. That means this vector field is a curl of something. But we don't have to find that curl. We just rewrite this one with a simpler surface, which is this S1, not this S entire thing that has this complicated shape, but it has the same boundary. If you look at just the disk in the XY plane, the boundary here is the same as this boundary. And if you orient it upward like this, and this two surface S1 and S has the same boundary and then same orientation. Therefore, we can calculate this surface integral over the simpler S1. So here I'm showing that. The surface integral original problem can be rewritten as a surface integral over this smaller disk, and it's a lot easier. And if you do the parameterization with the usual parameterization, x and y and 0, then it turns out it's the normal vector is just simply 0, 0, 1. And whatever the parameterization is, this dot product turns out to be 0. So altogether, you don't have to even do the polar coordinate um, change of variable. The dot product is 0. Therefore, the whole integral is 0. That's shown there. As you can see, this is a, a very, very cool um, application. Right, earlier results that um, this uh, integration of the surface integral does not depend on uh, which surface you choose, as long as you keep this um, boundary, uses the fact that um, uses divergence theorem. So divergence theorem requires that a solid that uh, encloses so for example, if you're looking at certain surface with a boundary and you close up, and um, that's how the argument goes. So require that all the vector field is defined inside the solid. So if you look at this problem, suppose this F, uh, vector field is not defined at 0, 0 there, then um, having the fact the divergence being 0 doesn't allow us to conclude this to th um, this um, vector field is um, the surface integral is zero. If it is defined it there and then you can pass the divergence theorem, divergence theorem says the triple integral of the divergence is zero. But we don't have that um, definition around zero comma zero. Therefore, we don't have the zero part.
But we have this theorem. As long as this S1 and S2 are closed surfaces like this, around the 0, 0, and it goes around, not hitting 0, 0, and then if we have a divergence, it goes 0, these two things are not necessarily 0, but they're equal to each other. This proof of this one is very similar to the proof that uh, the two variable case that if you have um, vector field whose curl is uh, zero, then you go around that uh, on singularity, and then it doesn't matter how you go around, as long as you go around once around, the integral value is the same. That is kind of analogous to that theorem. So not proven here, but if you slice this one into a half and um, you know do the same trick, and then orientation in the in the face is there. Um, facing each other, and then as you cut out, kind of cancel out, and similar thing happens. So, let me just state it this way: so, um, although we don't have this zero comma zero is not defined, we still have this nice result as long as we have divergence zero. Of course, if we have divergence zero and f is defined entirely, in, for example, in all three-dimensional space, then it means actually the um, the vector field is a curl of some vector field. But over here, not necessarily so. So let me remind you of um, this result here. If you have the scale of function and then this operation, this gradient vector field and curl vector field and divergence and put this one into a scale of function, these are linear differential operator and in general we have this uh, situation, this curl being, being zero, then not necessarily being a gradient. Divergent zero, not necessarily the curl of f. But all the gradient has this curl zero, and curl has this divergent zero property. Right? This could be a straightforward calculation, but it can be formulated using this integral property, and maybe in an abstract setting, um, the following proof makes more sense. So here's a theorem stated, if you start with the gradient vector field, and then if you do the curl it, if you do the curl operator, it becomes zero, and curl operator, and then followed by the divergence, it becomes zero. It could be a straightforward calculation, but it's a slightly different approach. First thing we do is that we suppose this curl of the gradient is not a zero vector. So this zero is not a number, it's actually the vector, because curl is supposed to vector. So this, um, every point in this, we have a different curl, right? So suppose there's a one point, this curl vector assigned here is a non-zero vector. What this means is that at that point, the P0 and the P0 is here, we have this non-zero vector, the magnitude of this vector is non-zero. And because it's all continuous and all, then around that point, this uh, vector, all the curl vector must be pretty much pointing the same direction. There might be a slight change around it here, but uh, because it's a very, very small region, by continuity of this vector field, it should be pretty much pointing exactly the, the same way. And then I chose this one as a perpendicular to this curl vector. Now we're about to use the Stokes theorem. So Stokes theorem starts with this curve. So we have a curve C. It's a line integral of this vector field, which is a gradient vector field. So this part is going to be Stokes theorem, but if you realize that actually our starts go back to the fundamental theorem of line integral. So this one says this one is the same as fb minus fa, but here's a c is a closed curve. So start and ending is the same, so fb and fa is the same thing, so it's a zero. So it's easy to understand why this one has to be zero. But if you keep using, um, if you go to the Stokes theorem part, and here's the following, um, here's what it says. So the curl because it's a closed curve, and it's a surface S that closes. So the curl of this gradient vector, um, the surface integral of this curl, is, is equal to this line integral. That's the Stokes theorem. Well, we need to observe it here. This, while we are calculating as a surface integral, is really flux. So this is the flux going out. It's not changing much. If you compare it with a normal vector, which we chose as this direction, so here's the usual the flux around it. It doesn't change very much, and the n is the normal vector to that side. So this dot product here is always going to be positive. So positive quantity against this um, area here uh, is going to be po definitely positive quantity. It's not quite showing, so I'm writing in here. It's a positive quantity. And uh, 
that's a problem. Zero is supposed to be exactly zero, but we picked up some positive corners, so that's that's not supposed to happen. So what uh, what it says is that if you suppose there is exi uh, existence of a point where the curl vector is non-zero, then we bump into some some sort of problem and contradiction, and mainly it contradicts the Stokes theorem and the fundamental theorem of line integral. So let's look at the second bit. The proof goes uh, very, very similar. To suppose that this divergence is non-zero at this time is a scalar. So we're looking at this, uh, some uh, positive or negative, which is non-zero. Suppose there is a point such that divergence is uh, positive or negative. Say there was a positive. It could be negative. The argument goes exactly the same. If it's a positive, and uh, by the continuity, that at that point to p0 around the p0 is not going to change the sign. If you're really, really close to p0, the divergence must remain positive by the continuity. So I put this surface as, and you can realize that uh, whole thing as a, a solid E. Let's say that uh, encloses a solid E there. I'm sorry, I was doing this slightly incorrect order, so let me introduce first uh, this general fact in here, and then I will use that to close off this proof fact that I want to introduce is the following fact, and if you do the surface integral of a curl over a closed surface like this S, it turns out it is always a zero. Right? It's analogous to line integral over a closed field of the, uh, of the gradient vector field, it turns out to be zero, which we use for curl of gradient being zero. So I, let me explain it this way. So S is this full closed surface, and S prime is a closed surface, and missing the tiny hole there. I suppose this is an egg and we have a tiny hole there. So S is not exactly the S prime, but it's almost the same and missing that tiny hole there. So I get this part's clear. Just, and if you compare the surface integral, S and S prime is almost the same, except it's missing the surface kind of enclosed by this um, little curve C. So if you make this hole and smaller and smaller like this, radius of this C being very, very small, then this, you can see the surface integral, integral is almost the same. I moved it slightly to the left here. So here's uh, what happened to this integral missing that a tiny region S, is that it's actually the Stokes theorem. If you look at this S prime, it actually has a boundary exactly at the C. You think about it, this, you know, it, we have originally tiny surfaces just uh, filling in that C, and then you have to blow in the air into it and then make it uh, bubble up like this. So, so that's exactly the boundary of C. If you look at it that way, I think it's easier to understand why this curve C is a boundary of S prime. So as long as C is a boundary of S prime, the Stokes theorem says the surface integral of the curl is the same as a line integral around it. So this thing here, what you see inside this limit, is exactly the line integral. And this one is not changing if C is very, very small and surrounding the zero. And size of the C being small, it's clearly that um, this line integral is going to approach zero. Therefore, this um, this whole thing approaches zero. That makes this constant integral has to be zero. So this is a fact. It's not that S is a small anything. As long as it's a closed um, surface, and if you do the surface integral of a curl, and that becomes a zero. So we just argue that this closed surface around this uh, surf, um, solid and this just surface integral of a curl has to be zero, but by divergence theorem, and this whole thing is interpreted as a triple integral of a divergence, and this E is very, very small, so divergence remains a positive here. So if you integrate the triple integral with some positive quantity, you should remain positive, but the, in, in that cannot be zero. So that's a contradiction. So again, if you suppose there is a single point where the divergence is a positive, it violates Stokes and divergence theorem together. Therefore, this divergence of a curl has to be zero all the time. Now let me return to this physics situation and then interpret this meaning of this thing and then um, that'll be it for this um, series. So um, let me remind you of the meaning of this uh, surface integral of the vector field. I interpret it as an early video as number of molecule crossing um, the surface S per second, for example. So let me demonstrate that with this uh, Mathematica um, animation. The vector field I chose is this particular one, x, y, comma, 2z, comma, y. So it looks like an arbitrary vector field.
you can write down any arbitrary vector field and think about the following question. Namely, you introduce the, some arbitrary surface and interpret this one as a number density, namely number of particle that crosses the surface as per second. This is that's what this measure what that's what this integral measures. So here's a surface I took. This is sitting inside an xy plane and then solid unit disk and sitting inside there. Then I'm going to sketch this vector field in there, which is a sketch that here. And as you can see, if you go over there, I kind of sample the points around, um, you know, three different radius and sampled it uh, evenly around this uh, different angles. Okay, so let me explain the meaning of this one. For example, if I choose this particular point right there, that means the uh, flux is um, actually the flow is going to that direction. So magnitude represent number of particles. So this number of particles is passing through. Um, if you perpendicularly measure, if you put a little perpendicular area one space in here, this is number of particle that passes through after one second. So if you actually measure it over this region in here, and it has to be um, slightly different calculation, the density is a slightly different calculation, which use a, a dot product. So how many particles are passing through the unit region on this S is uh, calculated through the dot product, and that's what we are um, integrating. So if you add them all up, and that's how many particles are and in and out. So if you have a certain orientation, like upward, as you can see, uh, some of the particles are escaping and it's going upward and some of the particles are going downward. And I did the calculation in, in this for this particular example, it's actually exactly zero. So number of particles going upward and downward and it's exactly zero. So the net, uh, net number of particle is here is exactly zero. So here's a slightly different surface. I'm trying to use this phenomenon of a, you know, integral not changing over the same, um, the different surface with the same boundaries. You can see I kept this, uh, I hope that's right. So that wasn't entirely correct and, and I fixed it. So it's definitely now at the uh, bottom um, boundary is exactly the same unit circle we had it before. But the surface different. Before it was just a flat disk and this time this is um, slightly different uh, surfaces, but the same boundary. So this is a sketch of the flux, and, and uh, at each point it shows that where the, the vector field is going. As you can see, there's a some going out there and some coming in. We calculated before it was uh, the zero, and then it uh, turns out this one is also exactly the zero. Um, but um, I'm going to explain why this is so in a and we're going to go back, but that's uh, what we mean by flux and how much is how many particles are escaping or coming in and through the surfaces is what we are calculating with that um, surface integral. Now I want you to think of the problem this way. The suppose S is uh, encloses on solid E, so S is actually closed surface. And what we are measuring here and through this uh, flux integral, is that this is, has all its own orient orientation. For example, let's say this oriented outwards, like this. And what it measures is that how much, um, if the positive number is integral values here, that means a lot of them are escaping through that part. And if the negative uh, calculation is done through the, this part, part of the surface integral, that means a lot of particles are going in. So if you add them all together, it calculates the net change of the number of particles going in and out. Unless this mysterious particle appears in here and there inside this region, and it should be clear that if this uh, vector field rises from the flow of actual liquid in three-dimensional space, how much going in must how much going out. The rate of change of the number of particles inside of here must be exactly the same. It can only contain on exactly the same volume of water. This S is an imaginary space, an imaginary surface we created here. So if you think about that volume, it always occupies exactly the same amount of water molecules in there. So this one, which uh, calculates per second calculation, how much of it going in, how much going out, is the exactly rate of change in the number of particles inside an E. And we know if it rises from actual water flow of water, it should be zero. So this should be happening for all the 
as is um, all the solid you choose and the surface is S. So by divergence theorem, that flux we calculated is exactly equal to the triple integral of the divergence. This is always a zero. And this property that this is always a zero for all um, solid E makes this divergence exactly zero, which is written here. Sorry about that. So if this really represents flow of a water molecule where there's no disappearing or appearance of this uh, number of molecules here and there, if that's have to be preserved, and this should be true. And again, what this says is that um, if that is so, the divergence must be must be zero. So if you happen to looking at formula of the water flow and the vector field, and then if you if it's uh, there's no single holes um, holes or sources, the divergence of that vector field must be zero. According to you know conservation principle of a number of uh, molecules that's contained inside E. But mathematically, if there's no singularity of FF is well defined everywhere, the divergence zero means it should be realized as a curl of something. So if you're looking at the water flow uh, with uh, uh, the conserved uh, number of particles, that vector field we're looking at must be curl of something. But if you happen to be looking at the vector field and you happen to have a way to measure this divergence, if it is positive at some, at some point, that means around that point, the conservation is not holding. Something is more escaping because if you choose this S outward orientation, more escaping. So that means um, then there is something is generated and there is a source that is coming inside from the outside of, from our space. For example, from the hole in the spring. A spring water is coming out of from the bottom of the hole something. So we call that point if the divergence is a positive source. And if we happen to be looking at a point where the divergence is zero, less than zero, that means there are more things are coming in and less things are coming out. That means it's uh, the molecules are disappearing. There must be a hole or a sink in there such that a disappearance. So divergence is an important um, invariant that attached to the um, not invariant, just quantity, the scalar attached to this vector field that measures this important quality, um, especially the, when the divergence is zero, and that's the way we describe this conservation principle in physics. Let me end this video with my favorite part of this whole subject as a mathematician and uh, who loves the geometry, and this is the most fascinating part, and then it uh, started from right here, and that's where the um, topology and started the shapes of this object is captured by discrepancy of the curl zero and gradient and then um, so I thought it's, you know that they actually uh, quantize quantize these discrepancies in, in terms of dimension of the vector spaces and then the meaning of that it's it's closely tied to the shape of the object we are looking at it here Thank you.